Hello everyone, my name is Eunseo Choi. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Texas at Austin. Thanks for inviting me at this unique workshop on benchmarking past, present, and future. I'm really excited to be here and I'm going to talk about context for interpreting benchmark performances. Benchmark consists of three parts. Uh, first is data sets uh, that maps input x to y, and then some evaluation metric um, that measures that the model predicts answer y, how much does it score compared to the scored annotation y. And then of course the model that maps input x into y. The first part of the talk, I'm going to talk about how are we going to consider the context of different models when you are comparing them. So some models are, you know, models are not all the same. They have different characteristics. Um, they use different amount of resources. Um, they are built with different assumptions and so forth. So one, how can we uh, provide more fair and useful comparison across different models when most of the data benchmark that we have only focuses on the evaluation metric of the final performances. So we are going to particularly look into this um, resource constraints, um, trying to incorporate the context of comparing model in terms of resources it's consuming. Okay, so that's going to be the first part of the talk. In the second half of the talk, I'm going to talk about the context for benchmark data itself. So data set that we are using makes some implicit extra linguistic context assumptions. Um, so for example, if we're using QA data, which labels who is the vice president and answer is Kamala Harris, this data set assumes that uh, we are in 2021 um, and also geographically we are in the United States. So I'm going to delve more into this issue of implicit extra linguistic context assumptions. So for the first part, before I want to talk a little bit about like you know how is NLP benchmarking and models are going into 2021. Um, there are some general benchmarks that we use a lot, like Glue or Extreme, that's focusing on general language understanding. And there are this more specialized benchmark focusing on particular aspects, common sense reasoning, multi-hand reasoning, and so forth. There's so many nice benchmarks out there. Um, I just randomly selected like some. Okay. Um, even though benchmarks are trying to capture different things, um, especially for this specialized benchmark, if you look at leaderboards these days, you will probably notice one trend that regardless of what kind of language phenomena you're trying to capture, the successful models are this really large pre-trained model trained longer on larger amount of data, perform consistently better on multiple benchmarks. Um, so that's what we see. Um, so given that we know that larger resources result in a better performances, um, how can we compare models, do more apples apple um, comparison across different models? So in 2020, uh, we hosted this um, Europe's competition named Efficient QA uh, with the goal of this comparing models um, that uses similar amount of resources. Um, the research question that we had is under the fixed resource constraints, what would be the best model achieving highest accuracies on the QA test that we are looking at? Um, this competition uh, was joint work with tons of folks. Um, Tom Kiyokoski at Google AI was initiated a project, and Simon Lin from the University of Washington has done a lot of work and also a lot of wonderful folks um, that hosted this event together. The task that we were looking at is open domain question answering. Um, so we collected search queries from um, Google and annotated with Wikipedia documents from multiple annotators and annotator provided the strings. Um, so this question answer pairs from natural questions data set are um, the thing that we are studying. Okay. And um, how are we going to measure using the same amount of resources? Um, we've discussed a lot about, you know, how are we going to measure this? Um, there are two uh, potential criteria that we could look at. One is the speed, training time, or inference time. Both are really important aspects of model. And also memory, how much storage is, is needed to store your model. I would like to briefly mention that none of these measures are very straightforward. Um, speed really depending on what hardware architecture you use, you know, how parallelizable they are. Um, and for memory, like what counts as your model, like, you know, should we include the dump of TensorFlow as um, part of your model or so forth. So none of these are very straightforward and requires careful planning, just like we are designing eva evaluation metric for task performances. Um, 
in this competition, uh, we are focusing on the memory constraints and we define memory constraints as the number of bytes required to store a Docker image that contains the complete self-contained QA system. This Docker image must include all code, libraries, um, parameters, and data required by your system. And we had these four separate tracks, unrestricted, under six gigabytes, under 500 megabytes. And the last special track of sm smallest system getting 25% accuracy. Um, we particularly designed it as a memory constraint because there has been this really interesting um, trends of two um, different architectures for open domain, sort of an open domain QA. Uh, one is a retrieval based model. So given a question, um, there, the neural network um, goes to documents collection, uh, retrieves relevant documents, and from the document selects the answer. And then there's this closed book approaches which doesn't use any document at inference time. Uh, but during training, um, this giant neural network has been uh, memorizing um, this document. And at test time, I'm given a question, it doesn't retrieve any document, just pops out the answer. And there are some hybrid approaches of this retrieval and closed um, book answer models as well coming up. So given our same memory constraints, uh, models can use their memory budget to either um, build a bigger neural network or store more documents. Um, so here you could see animations. Um, so this blue box is our memory budget. And you see that you could use this to store neural network um, parameters or the documents and um, combination of both. Um, as a result of efficient QA, uh, it was actually fairly successful. We received 39 submissions from 18 unique teams, and um, there were many interesting approaches to make models more memory efficient. And you can read um, all about it in our report um, available in our, our website. Um, I just would like to point out that the winning team are different teams um, on different categories. Although um, one team win on um, the last two buckets, but basically it, see, it shows that different approaches are more effective for different under different budgets. So um, yeah, before moving on to the second part, I would like to mention this one work uh, that came out of this efficient QA workshop um, called Probably Asked Questions. Um, so instead of using the document corpus, where usually um, models are trying to retrieve and try to answer the question from, they actually generate a tons of question answer pairs that might have been probably asked and use this um, question answer pairs as a knowledge resources that they will retrieve from. You could see why this might be more efficient use of uh, memory um, because document contains um, contents that it's rarely asked. And basically, you could design um, um, these QA pairs about only about the stuff that people are likely to ask about the particular documents. So um, this was a really um, successful system, and we just like this is kind of one example that we see that this memory constraints motivated new modeling approaches, and um, this was really um, useful um, for many diverse settings. Um, so thinking about this different context, incorporating different contexts into um, leaderboard design and also benchmarking might allow our field as a whole to um, develop some new models and interesting models um, that might help um, us to understand language better. Okay. Uh, with that, I would like to move on to the second part, so talking about context for the benchmark data themselves. What are the implicit um, Excel linguistic context of our data sets and um, how can we quantify them? So the example of who is the vice president and Kamala Harris, um, this QA pair will assume that um, this, question, this data set, the word that this data set describes is 2021 and geographical United States. Um, to people who are listening to this talk, it's probably not a surprise that language evolves. Um, so even the same chapter in the Bible, um, from Old English to 1600s to uh, modern, um, you see that language changes a lot. Um, new words comes up as well. Uh, when was the first time Google was used as a verb? Is Google officially a verb? Um, and even in the same word, we see that the meaning of the word changes over time. Um, 
there was some nice studies about this kind of modeling this um, linguistic changes or meaning changes. Okay. Similarly, um, benchmarks are evolving as well um, to reflect the changes in language usages. Um, so in 1990s, we built this pantry bank based on the Wall Street Journal. Um, but as more and more people are using Twitter, in 2011, um, people have built this NER tagging data sets on tweets. Um, there are more and more data sets from, that's I'm using language from Reddit and also new ways of using language um, like uh, mem, uh, memes. Um, so we see that um, data sets are moving along as well. Um, I think this is because um, we are trying to build data set that's a representation of the world. This quote was actually uh, describing the computer vision data sets, but I think it's kind of true for natural language processing data set as well. We are building data set um, that kind of represent the world we, we live in. Although its data set makes implicit assumptions about the world um, that it, it represents. So it's not the world, but it's the world that they um, that they live in. So it's not, yeah, it's kind of specific world that they're modeling. Okay. So before talking about how this impacts, um, our performances, I would like to switch gears a little bit and talk about how benchmark has changed in the past um, couple of years. So before, um, a lot of our data sets are capturing linguistic knowledge. Um, so dependence parse is a one good example. You know, you have a sentence and you are annotating um, this um, linguistic grammar, part of speech, morphological features, and syntactic dependencies. Um, so these are kind of data sets that we've been playing with, uh, universal dependency, pantry bank, and all. Um, we are looking at the linguistic benchmark capturing linguistic knowledge. Newer data sets are looking more and more into word knowledge. Um, so one prime example is this Lama data set, uh, where um, the input is mask sentence, um, and then you're trying to predict uh, what should fit into that mask. So the theory of relativity was developed by, and then the answer should be an Einstein. So Lama is designed as a probe for analyzing the factual and common sense knowledge contained in pre-trained language model. So similarly, inside the question answering as well, uh, before you are given a document context and all you have to do is linguistic analysis of matching question to a document context and finding the answer span. But these days, um, it's framed as um, open domain question answering where you just have the question and you have to find the answer. So you are not given the document, so you have to like know, basically you have to retrieve the right document or if you remember, um, these facts or knowledge about Joe Biden, then you could get the answers. Um, so you could see even inside the same task of question answering, it's shifting from linguistic analysis to more word knowledge inclusive um, task. Okay. And going from this linguistic analysis to more word knowledge have important um, implications about how applicable the data set is um, in the future. Okay, so let's look at these examples um, of um, dependency parse or sentiment analysis. Whether the data set was made in 2012 or um, 2015, um, a lot of times the annotations are still valid, right? So when you read the sentence about Dark Knight that 2010 or 2005, or if you read it um, in 2025, you will probably think the first sentence is positive and then the second um, sentence is more negative, right? And then the annotation of dependence parts wouldn't change over time either. But if you're looking at this um, Lama data set, um, you have this Christian Ronaldo place for mask and if you're trying to fill in the mask, um, if you were answering that question before 2018, the answer is Real Madrid, uh, but after 2018, the answer changed to Juventus um, FC. There's a really nice paper um, from Bulan um, that recently an archive that captures this, um, talks about this, time our language models as temporal knowledge basis. Um, so um, yeah, it's an observation that's shared by many people. Um, and also there's this um, 
this temporal dependence or pre-trained language models themselves as well. Um, so another nice paper, uh, pitfalls of static language modeling um, from DeepMind um, was observing the pre-trained language model trained on a corpus collected up to a fixed timestamp and um, perform worse when we're, it's trying to capture um, text from the future utterances. So temporal dependence is real and it's affecting our um, benchmark as well as model in uh, many ways. Um, and particularly, um, I was looking a little bit into this temporal dependent of question answering. Um, so for this particular question that's really relevant these days, it's COVID vaccines have been authorized for adults in the United States. Um, depending on which timestamp you're answering this question, the answer should change. Um, and also geographical dependence also happens. So if the question was which COVID-19 vaccine had been authorized by our government, um, if you're in the United States versus if you're in Australia, the set of answers will be different. Okay. So it's like when you're building um, benchmark data set that's more and more um, capturing the knowledge, um, then this extra linguistic context um, seems to interfere with our benchmarks. Um, and temporarily, um, our benchmark often assumes to be um, at the timestamp of data set creation. And geographically, it often assumes to be um, populated area with more NLP researchers like the United States um, and so forth. So um, these hidden assumptions are baked into the benchmark, um, requires careful um, thinking when we are interpreting the results um, or even when we are developing models. Um, recently, uh, with my student Michael, we've been looking into um, in depth about this integrating extra linguistic context into QA. Um, so we are studying how answer to the same question changes based on where the question was asked and when the question was posed. So integrating this temporal and geographical context into QA task and kind of frame it again as given a question and its corresponding extra linguistic context, find the answer. Uh, we've collected the additional data, uh, but we are looking at this original questions um, from five open retrieval data and first went through annotation step of identifying is this question temporally or geographically dependent and then collect uh, multiple optional um, context answer pairs and then went through the last verification phase. Overall, we observe that all of these data have at least 10% of temporal dependent questions, some as high as 40%. Um, so here are some examples um, that's in our data sets, um, question, tempo, context type, and then um, context value. And you could see that based on this context value, the answer will change. And we also could do some interesting analysis with this data um, because we are collecting multiple answers. Um, so uh, we are contact collecting for temporally, we are contacting the most recent answer and the second most recent answer. Um, and we see that um, a lot of facts that's asked in this data set change over like less than a year mark and so forth. Okay. Um, so further, I'm gonna talk a little bit about this temporal dependence of question answering model. Um, and how are you? How would it gonna affect the performances? Um, so both the pre-trained language model that QA models are built up on, and as well as the large-scale training data, are from 2018. But our new data set contains question-answer pairs where answers are updated post 2018. Um, can models answer these harder questions where you have to use this newer? Um, updated word knowledge um, can, as well as question that you don't have to update. Um, so that was kind of what we are trying to look into. Um, so um, we are not um, changing the task definition. Um, it's still given a question, provide an answer. Um, so we're assuming this present all in 2021 when we are doing this study as the temporal context and models are pre-trained on original NQ data, but fine-tuned further with our data. So it knows that 2021, it, I mean, knows that 2021 is the context it's been looking at. And we are split the evaluation data into two subsets, um, easy ones and hard ones. Easy ones are where the answer hasn't changed since 2018. 
Um, so there is no discrepancy between um, when was the last documents that BERT model have seen, which was 2018, and um, this large scale NQ data. And then the harder subset where um, the, the um, word has been updated. Um, so here are, are the results. Um, so humans are, as you can imagine, perform pretty consistently. And for closed book model, which doesn't have access to any new documents, as you can imagine, because they were like pre-trained on up to like 2019. So on the harder subset where we have to really know about this up-to-date text that it didn't have access to, it drops significantly. Uh, for retrieval based model, um, if it's given to retrieve from old corpus, which was 2018, you see a really large drop between this easy and hard questions. Uh, but when you are, it's given that the newer corpus to retrieve from, actually the performance improves significantly, but still um, the model is like 10 points worse on these questions uh, where the fact has been updated. Um, so it seems like there is like artifacts, um, the temporal artifacts that goes into um, model performances. Um, we actually have a bunch of more analysis and I'll be happy to chat about it. Um, so we're also looking into this geographical context. So this is the same setup um, of open domain QA. Um, we are posing this question, an ambiguous question with missing geographical context. When was the last time states were created? And we're trying to see like what geographical context the model is assuming and generating answers from. So we are comparing the predicted answer against the answer from specific geographic context as code references. And not surprisingly, um, the model usually assumes the context to be in the United States. Um, India was another popular option, and um, for rare locations, the match was a lot less frequent. And surprisingly, there was like not that much difference between the ritual based versus closed book uh, model here. Okay, so I've talked about this like you know interplay with between extra linguistic context. Um, and the benchmark and so that kind of keeps us hanging like how should we keep benchmark relevant for the future when our language evolves daily and the word knowledge that we deal with. One way to deal with is that we can fix the word knowledge that we will query from. Um, so one effort was um, this kit benchmark where you are basically fixing this specific dump of Wikipedia that um, all the task will be based on. This is, this makes it easier to compare the models, but it's kind of unsatisfying in a sense that, you know, you don't want to rebuild this data sets uh, with newer data bump data stems all the time, right? So that's kind of pros and cons. Second approach is just keep updating the test set with newly acquired examples. Um, so there has been um, some papers, um, like Turing advice, which is using more recent Reddit um, posts as a test set, um, and Dynabench, uh, which keeps generating new test examples, although it has slightly different focus of generating uh, more challenging examples for the model. Um, yeah, and just more thinking about like when does benchmark stops being relevant? Um, one way we've been using data sets, I think, was that you know we have human performance. And if the model performance gets to the human performance, then maybe that's where when we should stop using this benchmark. Um, but maybe another criteria that we should consider is when language or knowledge that's represented in this data set um, no longer reflect our world. Right, the, when the extra linguistic context that's assumed um, start to be different from where we currently stand. Thanks for listening to my talk. I was talking about how should we consider different types of context when interpreting benchmark results. Um, I was talking about that we should consider this computational resources when evaluating different models and benchmarks. Um, and also we should consider, really think about extra linguistic context that's baked in into our benchmark data. And the remaining question is how can you keep our benchmark relevant in the further future uh, when language usage changes dynamically? Um, thanks so much for um, your attention.